Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Ms. Block. It's good to have you here. You're being nominated to fill the board seat that Nancy Schiffer will leave in December. And before I begin with my questions, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge Ms. Schiffer and thank her for her service. Her intelligence and dedication to the work of the NLRB has served our country well, and we are all grateful. And I am pleased now that Ms. Block, we will, with Ms. Block, we will have a qualified nominee to take over and to keep up the good work. So, Ms. Block, I have heard some of my colleagues across the aisle attack you for accepting a recess appointment. However, over the past 35 years, spanning three Democratic presidents and three Republican presidents, there have been 29 recess appointments to the NLRB, 16 Republican nominees, and 13 Democratic nominees. Now, the President of the United States asked you to serve your country by joining the NLRB, and your first appointment was consistent with this long bipartisan tradition of recess appointments. Later, when the D.C. District Court decision came out, advancing a split among the courts, you and other members of the board followed the longstanding NLRB policy and waited for the Supreme Court to resolve the conflict that existed among the courts. Now, can you explain why the NLRB has this policy of waiting for the Supreme Court to resolve disputed decisions reached by the circuit courts. Thank you, Senator. Um, you know, I think it, it just comes from an understanding of how our federal court system works. The, uh, again, obviously, no canning was a constitutional issue, but uh, the context in, in which I'm more familiar is just when the board issues decisions. Um, the board issues those decisions for the country as a whole, not for particular geographic areas. And it, it can happen that there are splits in the circuits, that the circuit courts sitting in, in different parts of the country can come to different conclusions. And we know that the way our federal court system works is whether it's an interpretation of the National Labor Relations Act, even more importantly when it's a constitutional question, that the Supreme Court is the ultimate arbiter of those questions. So in your particular case, but this is part of longstanding tradition with the NLRB, we waited for the resolution in the dispute among the circuits about what the appropriate rule was in this case on recess appointments. And when the Supreme Court spoke to it, then we knew what the law was. Is that a fair statement? Yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously I left the board before the Supreme Court um, ruled, but as I mentioned um, in the first, in answer to the first question that Chairman Harkin asked, it was important to me and I did know that that process was moving forward throughout the entire tenure that I had on the board, that after the Noel Canning decision came out from the D.C. Circuit, the Solicitor General filed a petition for certiorari ensuring that the process towards resolution you know, would continue to move in that direction. Well, good. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your willingness to serve, and thank you in particular for your willingness to serve at the NLRB so that we could have a board that fairly represents the people of this country. I have one other question I'd like to ask you about, and that is about scheduling. Um, unpredictable and last-minute scheduling is a very serious problem for a lot of low-income and part-time workers. Many of these workers want a full-time job with stable hours, but many jobs today, particularly in service and retail industries, are part-time, or if they are full-time, they're often on shifting schedules. Now, when work schedules are more stable and more predictable, families experience greater economic security, they're better able to plan for child care and for other family obligations. But I've met with employees who've been retaliated against solely for asking for more stable schedules. Not demanding, just asking for some scheduling help to attend a college course or to manage childcare obligations. So I am pleased to have joined Chairman Harkin in introducing the Schedules That Work Act. This is a bill that would guarantee that all employees could request certain times scheduling 
free of retaliation. It would also discourage last minute scheduling while still giving employers flexibility to make changes based on their business needs. So what I wanted to ask you is I understand that it is Congress's job to write the laws and the NLRB's job to enforce the rules. But with scheduling practices as a growing area of concern, I wanted to ask you if the NLRB has been involved in settling disputes on scheduling issues, and if you might just help inform us a bit about this issue. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, the board has long been involved in these kinds of issues as a result of them being important to employees and employees um, joining collectively to ask their employers to address the issue. So it is clearly scheduling is a, a, a critical aspect of, a ter of an employee's terms and conditions of employment and the National Labor Relations Act gives employees the right either through a collective bargaining representative if the employees choose that that um, vehicle for expressing their, their um, collective action or just through protected concerted activity to raise concerns about terms and conditions of employment. So the act does in fact give a way for employees to express those concerns, share them with employees in a manner that's protected. Well, thank you very much. I understand that securing a predictable work schedule is one of the reasons that workers often decide to unionize. I hope to continue to work with Senator Harkin to advance our bill so that some flexibility and some sensibleness uh, is appropriate uh, and available to all workers in the case of trying to make a reasonable schedule. So thank you very much, Ms. Block. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the NLRB. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Uh, 